I'm sure this last lightning session has provoked some new thinking uh, from our panelists. So, um, and I'm just checking checking the app to see what's coming on traffic, if anything at this stage. Um, just to while we're getting warmed up, um, one thing that I've been aware of here is uh, we haven't had many end users. Uh, I guess we're all consumers at some stage or another, but we haven't intentionally invited uh, consumers um, into this forum, uh, although I believe there was a consumer representative here yesterday. I'm not sure if she was here today. Um, to, to what extent should we be more intentionally when we're talking, having fora and meetings around AI uh, be involving uh, citizens, uh, was, it was raised early. So I just wonder if there's some reflection uh, and what does that look like from the panel? Anybody want to take that? Perhaps Rochelle, you can speak to that because that's your... I think personally that it's uh, critical that we engage uh, the citizens. It's um, about the social licence, which John was talking about. Yep. And um, I think it also echoes um, dignity and respect. And I think that we need to build social values um, at the outset into these models and it's what I was saying, it's ethics by design at the outset and if we lose trust uh, then it's game over basically. If I could just add to that, um, I think uh, it's also, so I agree with Rochelle, uh, but in addition to that I think it's also a case of um, understanding that it's not horses for courses and um, uh, I think there are certainly different uh, groups and different worldviews that also need to be understood and the capability of workforces to um, interpret those worldviews or um, nuances is really important as well. Thank you. Anybody? Um, yep, we've got a question at the back there. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. So um, let me preface this by saying I agree with the uh, responsibility for people, patients, to own their own data um, and to, uh, to really have this social responsibility with all of it. But I'm curious your thoughts on the unintended consequences of people withholding their data from data sets and then the uh, algorithms, the programs, the interventions made to de design to improve care for people uh, end up inherently flawed due to uh, missing information and not really understanding the population that they're trying to serve. Okay, great question. Who'd like to start the response to that? Any takers? Yeah, well, probably just an initial response just to get the ball rolling. Um, I think part of the, the first question I'd ask is why, why are people withholding um, and then work from there because I think uh, the fact that um, people are distrusted. So I think part of it comes back to trust. Um, so that would be my, my initial thought is, um, uh, and it kind of looks back to that first question in terms of ensuring that you, you get the uh, citizen, client, users um, uh, perspective on things before you um, go ahead and design something for them. So I think that raises the issue of um, data ownership um, and whether we need to explore moving away from that more to data rights and obligations of reciprocity. I heard a comment the other day that we're all um, interconnected, we're victims and vectors of disease and I think um, that it would be good to explore more notions of reciprocity with our um, shared data and look at data rights. I mean, privacy rights, you don't have an absolute right to privacy. It's all about balancing um, uh, harm and, and benefit. Mm. Yeah. I'm noticing that you said unintended consequence, mm. and uh, the origins of Indigenous data sovereignty came from the Canadian jurisdiction where um, Canadian uh, Indigenous people met with the person who runs the census and had some suggestions about how to run the census. and and they described the, the guy leaning back in his chair, put his hands behind his head and laughed at them. And they left that meeting and said, right, we're going to act. And so the act of not giving your consent is intentional, or at least many times can be intentional. It's not an unintended consequence. 
this might be an intended consequence, and I think that Indigenous people certainly can exercise that right. And um, the, the trust issue is that your algorithm ain't perfect already. It fails for lots of reasons, and I'm OK with that, and you should be OK with me intentionally contributing or not. Over. Um, I suppose I agree with the comments made. I'm, I'm just also thinking that um, we need to have the conversations to what are people's expectations, what they understand around the data that's in there already and, and its use. When you talk to uh, people in, in society, they expect the visibility of their data. They're quite surprised when if you turn up at one venue and they can't see your data, because they assume if your data's in the health system, it's in the health system, and it should be visible for all health practitioners who are seeing that person. So there is a, we need to learn what are people's understanding around the data at the moment, and actually what are their expectations going forward. I think it's also around the conversations about what are we using the data for, um, and how is that positioned in a way that is, reflects what society would like as well. Um, I'm an oncologist as well, and I know that when we've got people with cancer, they want every available treatment that is available and every bit of information or evidence base we can have to help them have a better outcome. And maybe it's about positioning, actually using the data to get them also to have better outcomes. So maybe it's around how we position the discussions, but I think there are discussions we need to have with the public. Good. Any other comments from the other panel members on that particular strand? Otherwise, I was going to, um, while we're thinking about questions, or anybody else got any responses? From yes, thank you. Kia ora, thank you. This, this is really just a question about the fact that um, we've been here discussing data for an awful long, for you know, number of hours. Um, I'm wondering how much of this data is going to be available for people to download um, in terms of presentations. Um, I'm also wondering whether you are actually capturing the thinking and the discussions that we're having in these panel discussions when they're going to publish them. Good. Um, I'm Atsurori, one of the conveners. Um, we have been both recording all of our lecture sessions uh, as well as uh, audio of some of our presentations and our workshop presentations as well that we've collected. Um, so we will be making as much as possible accessible uh, through, through our website, um, as well as a, a report after the conference. Thanks. Great question. Um, Leo, did you have a question? Yeah, so it's just, more, just more of a comment that when we start engaging the people uh, in, in discussing about the ethical issues around data sharing, they should also be made aware that the status quo is far from optimal, where New Zealand doctors are taking care of New Zealand patients using research coming from the United States, research coming from the UK, and that there's also obviously uh, a downside in continuing the status quo. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, yes. Can I be a disruptive influence for a minute? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think the data, to, the data and information challenge is actually upside down. Uh, let me give you an analogy. I first arrived in uh, London in 1978, and I got a taxi from Heathrow to the Strand Palace Hotel. And the value proposition that day was explicit. The taxi driver knew how to get there and got me there. He had knowledge. In fact, he'd passed an exam called the knowledge. So the value proposition was explicit. And I was sitting in a taxi the other day going from Heathrow again to an airport in Covent Garden, holding my phone, thinking, what's the value proposition here now? I have better real-world intelligence available to me through my phone than this guy does. He didn't ask me if I wanted to go the fast way or the cheapest way or the tourist way. So I sat there. In fact, for 10 minutes before we got into a traffic jam, I knew we were going to hit a traffic jam. <laughs> so, and I sat there thinking, well, the problem we have in healthcare is analogous to that London taxi driver. I see patients one day a week, and if they have an unusual condition, it is very, very rare that they don't know a lot more about it than I do. The value proposition has already changed. Consumers are already heavily informed, and we are still preparing health workers for a world where our value perspective was owning knowledge. In fact, 
the, physician, the College of Physicians, I used to be the chairman of the Board of Education, we still have an exam which actually rewards retention and recall of knowledge. But it's no longer valuable. The skill set we're missing is actually helping, it's called information brokerage, you're helping people take all the information available to them and assimilating it in a way where they can make a sensible choice about what they will or won't do. The, data, the challenge here is not to make information accessible, it already is. It's how do we make health systems, how do we upskill people in the health systems to actually help people manage that information to make sensible choices. And the other uh, disruptive thing I'd like to say is I agree entirely with Andy. I can't remember the last time a patient of mine said to me, I'm concerned about my privacy, but they get really, really pissed off when we don't share information. What makes them angry is when I go through the same stories, make them do the same exercises and repeat the same sort of processes which they've done time after time after time. Their expectation of us is that we share information in a way which meets their needs. They don't understand the fact that we're trying to get out of citadels of information and move into a shared perspective. So I'd just like to tip the argument on its head. The real challenge for us in the next few years is not how we generate substantive intelligence for the community. It's already there. But how do we as health providers actually help them use that information mm -hmm. in a way that enables good choices to be made by them? And I guess that the argument, should consumers be involved, we're a service industry for goodness sake. It starts with understanding what the people we're serving know, want and expect. So I just want to just tip it on its head a bit there, because I think the challenge is actually back the front. It's not generating more knowledge, it's helping people manage that knowledge. Great, thank you. Um, you also talked about people withholding information. I work for an insurer. People withhold information from us because they think it's in their interest. But all of you healthcare professionals, you also experience that. Patients don't give you complete information when they think it's in their interests. So supporting what Des says, let's go back to the shoes of the patient and make sure they understand that complete download of information and the use of that information is in their interests, mm -hmm. which goes back to the open discussion with the public. Mm. So what, um, I will take a question from you in a minute. Do, what, is that, what are the implications for workforce development, Des, as a result of what you've just said? Oh, uh, they are profound. Uh, Chris, I still think we're preparing doctors, nurses and other health professionals for 1850. Mm. Uh, I still think we actually believe that the value that we add in the health system is knowledge and knowing things. Mm. I remember as a medical student in 1971, I was taught the brain was hardwired. We're born with a certain number of brain cells, and what we do doesn't change brain morphology. Mm. Completely wrong, completely wrong, and completely wrong. Mm. Uh, and yet that was what we thought had value. And if you want to pass the physician's exam this afternoon, you will have to memorise Harrison's textbook of medicine and repeat it. Mm. We're actually still training people for a world where that actually doesn't have value. Yeah. Um, and, and I think helping... You know, the sort of skills we're not teaching, Chris, are things like um, some people monitor, they want to know everything possible about their health condition. Some people blunt, they just want to be reassured to be okay. We don't have the health psychology skills to distinguish the monitors from the blunters. We, we also have people, people have uh, coping skills. Some people are catastrophic, some people are diminishing. We don't have those health psychology skills. And even little things like uh, someone's illness perception, you take an oncologist like, like Andy, I remember once as a medical student uh, being told by Sir John Scott to go and chat to a lady who had an unusual form of breast cancer, and I spent hours talking to her, I thought, lucidly. The next day in the ward round, Sir John said, what did this young guy tell you? And she, he, she said, he told me I've got six months to live. And before I could say, you're lying shit, he, he, he grabbed my arm and escorted me out of the room. And he said, what did you learn? I said, I learned that breast cancer for her means six months to live. She never heard another mm -hmm. single mm -hmm. word. Yeah. I said. So the answer to your question is the skill sets that the modern health provider needs, mm. we're not teaching. Mm. We're still stuck in a time warp where knowledge was sacred. And if, with all due respect, it's ephemeral and it, it's uh, 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 fragile mm. and it's usually wrong. Mm. And our, as I said, I mean, I sit there with my patients. They teach me a great deal every time I do a clinic mm. and I'm very grateful for them. But what I can help them do is manage it in a way yeah. where they can choose a way forward. That's the skill I bring, but the navigation. Exactly. Mm. Great. Now we had a question up there. Kia ora. Thank you for those great um, lightning mm. talks. I'm just wondering, uh, Rawari, um, you had that slide about determinants of health, and it just had 20% in the clinical zone. I think it's sort of, in a way, this whole 
two days, it's been about that 20% about about um, insights in that zone. But I'm wondering, what is the challenge of that? Like, if the other 80% is broader social stuff, it's housing, it's environment, what actions would that lead you to suggest? Revolution. Your application's been accepted. <laughs> Um, and it's good, you guys, if you want to throw yourselves into the 20% and make that really great and somewhat cheaper and needs less doctors, get busy, do it. I think it's a very good thing to do. Uh, but um, many of you could also be part of looking at other aspects, eh? And looking at the contributions to health outcomes from other parts of the determinants of health. And I think the application of artificial intelligence there is useful to think about as well. Can I just yes. ah. No, your time's up. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite polite, but David and I have heard too many times to count our colleagues say, uh, I just do the healthcare stuff. I just work in that 20% where it's directly related to handing out pills or chopping people open. When in fact, as David pointed out, Healthcare is the whole of society. So we can't, as healthcare professionals, just work in that 20% and abrogate all responsibility for the real health of the patient. You have an obligation to work in the whole of the person's life. You know, can I add another bit, please? Would you want sure. no. the, uh, uh, There are six projects that Eru didn't mention that MSD is running, uh, and most of them are around mental health, and I chair the governance group. And what's fascinating, coming to the point you're making, is that when you sit down with a population of people who have significant mental health issues and say to them, what is it that you want? None of them said, I want my depression score to go from 26 to 15. None of them. None of them said, I'd like an antidepressant with fewer side effects. They said, I want to live independently and I'd like a job. Mm. And so guess what we've targeted the health interventions are doing? Enabling them to live independently and get a job. And what's fascinating is some of the younger cohorts in these studies is that high levels of peer addiction have washed away when they've been actually in, been employed or put into education. And we've, so in fact, if you actually talk to people with traditional health problems and say, what would you want as an outcome for this intervention? They will often address the actual determinants of their health problem, not some meaningless nonsense like my depression inventory score dropping by 20 or 30%. And the, the point I'd make about you might say, well, that's an abrogation of responsibility to deal with a health problem. The group, when you look at, for example, drug use in people who you actually get employment for, the drug use washes away. So, in fact, I actually think the answer to your question is the health providers have got to be asking, when you design a health system, is what is the value that someone would ascribe to particular outcomes? And, by the way, the key word, in my view, in terms of health planning for the next decade is the word value and value to different people seen in different, in different ways. Thank you. OK, we have a question here. Thank you. Uh, so I don't have a question. Uh, uh, oh, we do. Firstly, I just want to... Um, I just want to meet to the panel. Nice to see at least four of you being uh, of Māori uh, descent. Tēnā uh, In that vein, uh, my question is, this, this, this whole discussion around the AI space, machine learning, big data, and some of the issues, you know, Rauri, uh, Peter, you guys have spoken about, oh, and Edu, around the uh, Māori performance, Māori outcomes, where we're heading, whole order, well-being, all that sort of good stuff. So I'm interested uh, to hear from you, where's the space in this where Māori take a proactive role in shaping the application of AI, and I'm particularly interested in that space around where you think the role is for iwi, providers and rangatahi. Rangatahi in the sense that these are the ones who haven't been crushed into a particular thinking paradigm. They don't, they don't kind of feel the walls that are blocked in by everybody else. Yeru, perhaps do you want to start? <laughs> um, yeah, that, lots of uh, big issues in that. Um, I certainly think that, uh, in my experience, uh, working in the north, uh, part of it's about creating um, a safe space. Um, one of the things that I think I do, and I'm sure I'm not the only person um, uh, who does this, is the ability to translate between Māori communities 
and government. Uh, and the, one of the uh, pilots that Des refers to, that's all I really did. Um, the particular uh, community, 90% uh, of the community is uh, of Māori descent. 90% uh, of the community um, is unemployed. Um, a researcher that worked alongside Des and I um, in the early uh, stages commented that um, it appears that it's when people go into this community they, need, they don't come out. Um, so it's basically one way in, no way out. Um, fortunately, um, given some of the methods that Des referred to, uh, we've seen um, a change in that. Um, but as I said, I think part of it is about creating a space where um, uh, and I think a, a way, that's why, why I think Des keeps talking about, um, uh, I think you're referring to user-centred design as well. Des, I'm, I'm big on that as well, because it, it, it um, I suppose, shifts the conversation from um, it's just about Māori to actually we need to do this. We just need to start with Māori. In my view, they're the most extreme users of, um, of uh, welfare, health and welfare services. Um, the other part of this, to a, a, a discussion that uh, Rawi and I, Rawi and I were having prior to um, presenting today was around uh, Māori ownership. So not just um, a workforce, not just uh, holding governance roles, but also uh, having a stake in the institutions that influence um, the rules of the game. Um, so I think that there's an opportunity in that as well. It was a very complicated question, but you meant it to be. Uh, I, I think the, the point about self-determination is at the level of uh, co-development of a model of care to address a clear perception of what the community wants delivered. And I'll give you an example. The projects that Aaron and I have just been alluding to, we use the business school here in the, university, in the engineering school to do big data analyses of the IDI to identify vulnerable communities. Then we use big data analyses to identify what's the whole of society cost for a lifetime for those communities. I'll give you an example. For every child born to a single mother, the cost is $1.25 million, because one in four end up at child, youth and family, 80 per cent fail school, 80 per cent end up in jail. That's the progression. And the point about that counterfactual development is it then contextualises the investment you can make in that community. And then you use big data to say, well, if we're going to spend $50,000, how many lives would we need to change for that to be a positive investment? So the big data analyses produce the actuarial background. But in fact, what we've done in these projects is then gone to the communities and said, we are agnostic about how we deliver the model of care. Let's find, in fact, what the user requirements are. And let's let the delivery system evolve out of existing resources and and, for example, Eru's used a um, trust that was already in place and had trust. In the Waikato, we took middle-aged Māori women and upskilled them as case managers to m manage younger Māori with drug and alcohol uh, problems. But, in fact, we were completely process agnostic. And by being process agnostic, the community not only was able to define what it valued as an outcome, but the model of care came out of that community. Now, there's two points. The six projects don't look like each other in terms of the way care is delivered. And in fact, none of them look like conventional mental health services at all, thank God. Can I disagree with you, Des? You can. Fill the books. Thank you. Um, the success of those programs, Des, however, is, is built upon Māori leadership and a Māori method of engagement, which I think goes to... Uh, a disagreement. I can, we're in love with each other again. <laughs> Okay, I think we've got uh, David uh, to. Uh, um, I think the Māori workforce is really a part of that. And you think we had Ernestine, we had um, Kylie, we had Andrew Spall. You think about the number of Māori PhDs who are coming through, and I don't know what's all those real fields make a difference. Not doctors. There's a lot of Māori doctors happening, right? Mm -hmm. Our two co conveners. So think about all of that. And I think there's also a whole lot of Māori businesses that want to be part of that. If, you, if in your head the analysis ends up with there's a Māori digital divide and what we've got to do is get more laptops out into Māori communities, I think you miss the big part, which is where you're going, and make sure that Māori represented in the, you know, the business solutions of doing it and you can see them in the companies. And So everybody here should be collaborating with Māori who are doing their masters and their PhD and all the rest of it. That is part of the future. 
that fellow with the white shirt on, he, he asked the question, he wanted to ask a question, and you missed him. Could you go to that fellow? <laughs> I think it's related as well. Um, earlier in the Ministry of Health talk, it was mentioned about in taking data through um, social media and things like the Apple Watch and the Fitbit. Um, but when I saw that, I was kind of worried because I, I feel like if we do that, there's a risk that we're then going to end up uh, tailoring policy to people who can afford a Fitbit, um, which you know is not a lot of the low income, which is predominantly in some parts Maori community. Um, so how do we use that data and not ignore that it exists, but then also not, um, I guess, you know, increase inequalities by then um, using that, that are, to create interventions that are going to help the people we got information from. Yeah, we used to think that um, getting uh, reminders to patients to go to hospital would be a problem for the wider community. It turns out that cell phone penetration in the wider community is greater than the market. Yeah. So what it needed to do was use the right technology. Yeah. And that's the answer to your question. Understand what the community is using, what their as Des would say, you know, what is their need, and develop your service directed at that. So it might not be Fitbit, but it'll be something. Yeah. It might be on the rugby league field. It might be at the netball court. It'll be somewhere. It'll be something different. Try and disagree with me, Des. No, no. So just <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, your point about gadgetry is well taken. It's uh, affluent middle class gadgetry. Yeah, uh, it's good. not the, the, the wellness paradigm doesn't sit there. The wellness paradigm for me is, a, is Plunkett nurses identifying infants with learning disabilities. It's school nurses identifying frequent flyers who are, have emergent mental health issues. It's about midwives who can tell you the problems that problemed families in their communities. It's about identifying resources early, which make a lifetime difference. Fitbits for affluent middle class people is gadgetry. Interesting. Thank you. Any, uh Last minute comments because we're going to wrap up the session now. Thanks, Eru. Um, yeah, I don't trust Apple. <laughs> I don't trust Google. I'm just saying. Okay, that's good. I think part of this is um, about what the end game is and, and having, uh, having a common understanding about what, why we do all of this. Mm. So a, a simple um, reflection I had when I uh, went to San Fran um, in July of last year was, um, and I visited... Um, Uber and a whole bunch of other tech companies while I was there, was um, the, the thing in, when, I'm, when you're in Northland is it's always about, people always think it's about the economy. Um, and uh, Silicon Valley is often held up here in New Zealand at least as um, what good looks like. Uh, so what I saw was um, lots in, in terms of human capital, um, some of the smartest uh, tech people in the world, um, uh, lots of uh, venture capital, um, some of the uh, biggest um, uh, technology companies in the world, and they're all there. So here in New Zealand, we've got this um, fascination with um, uh, being like that. Um, the other observation I made while I was there was the level of homelessness, um, and it's just in your face. And that did make me think uh, carefully about um, how we view prosperity, uh, because that's not prosperity in my view. Uh, and I think one of the now bring it back to your question is um, how do you ensure that um, and part of this is probably about the role of government as well that um, uh, we're all working uh, to towards the same end um, so I just thought I'd share that reflection there might be some comments on that I think we will leave that reflection as our last comment for the panel I'd like you to join with me in thanking our panellists for it's been a fantastic session